This is a demonstration of the Bruce Single Stage Submaximal Aerobic Capacity Test. This test allows us to calculate an estimated VO2 max, which can serve as a means to help more accurately prescribe exercise for our clients. For this test, you will need a motorized treadmill that it can increase to a 14 to 16 percent grade and can increase speed to the tenth mile per hour, a blood pressure cuff, a rating of perceived exertion scale, typically the Borg 6 to 20 scale, and while a heart rate monitor can be used, we will be taking heart rates manually. If using heart rate monitors, it's best to use one with a chest strap since monitors that read from the wrist have yet to be validated. Prior to performing the single stage protocol, and as prior to any exercise, be sure your patient is medically cleared to perform the test. Have the patient sit quietly for about five minutes and take heart rate and blood pressure readings. Be sure to view the heart rate tutorial and the blood pressure tutorial for specific instructions on how to measure these. If your client is severely deconditioned or has other medical issues that would prevent them from starting on the first standard stage, you can use the modified Bruce to start them at a lower MET level. For this demonstration, we'll be using the standard Bruce protocol. Once blood pressure and heart rate have been measured and are within normal ranges, your client is ready to begin the test. To begin the test, have your client straddle the treadmill before you bring up the speed and grade. If the treadmill starts very slowly, it is acceptable to allow the client to remain on the treadmill as the speed and grade are brought up. Just be sure they are holding on to the rails to prevent them from tripping. The first stage of the Bruce Single Stage Submaximal Protocol begins at 1.7 miles per hour of the 10% grade. Be sure to watch your client as they begin to walk and ask them to let go of the rails once they are comfortable. If you have not yet placed the blood pressure cuff on the client's arm, now is an acceptable time to do that. When fitting the cuff, be sure to remember the points brought up in the blood pressure tutorial. The client can hold the bulb while walking, and you can clip the gauge to the sleeve or to the cuff itself. 10 seconds before the end of the first minute marks the point at which you should take heart rate. Take a 10 second pulse count and multiply that by six since there are six 10 second intervals in one minute. This will give you their heart rate. You can use the timer on the treadmill, you can use your watch or whatever timing device you need in order to keep track of the 10 seconds. You will also notice how the arm is being supported when taking the heart rate. It should not be holding onto the rails or resting on any part of the machinery. Record the heart rate and get ready to take it again during the second minute. When you are conducting an exercise test, be sure to communicate with the clients and ask them how they're feeling. One thing I've learned is to be sure to avoid any kind of leading questions. For example, are your legs burning yet? Or, or are you tired? Ask them how they're feeling and if they're okay. And you also have the rating of perceived exertion scale at the end of each stage to get an idea of how tired they are. Take the two minute heart rate in the same way as we did in the first minute. Again, notice the arm is being supported, and once you have your pulse count, record it on your data sheet. Here we see heart rate was 82 in the first minute, and 93 here in the second minute. The last minute of each stage is the busiest because of the additional measures of blood pressure and RPE, in addition to having to decide if the client is in steady state or if a fourth minute is required, and if they need to proceed to the next stage altogether. Make sure you have your RPE scale and be ready for blood pressure on this third minute, but remember to take the heart rate first. Heart rate always takes precedence over blood pressure. When taking blood pressures, follow the procedures as outlined in the blood pressure tutorial and notice how the arm is cradled. As with taking heart rate, the arm should not be resting on any part of the machinery and should be relaxed in the administrator's hand. If you're a little slow in taking blood pressure and run over the three minutes, that's okay. Going a few seconds into the next stage is not going to make a big difference. The main thing is to not panic or get flustered and lose control. Once you have finished taking the blood pressure and the RPE, record the data. 
And as you increase the speed and grade into the next stage, just simply note the time. We see our client's heart rate for minute two is 93 beats per minute, and minute three is 96 beats per minute. We know that steady state because it's within the five beat parameter, but we must proceed to the next stage because her heart rates are well below the 110 beat per minute minimum. The speed for the second stage is 2.5 miles per hour with a 12% grade. You continue to monitor to your client, continue with the protocol in the same way as in the first stage. Our client's heart rate in the first minute of the second stage is 108 beats per minute. And in the second minute is 114 beats per minute. The end of the second stage rolls around and we take heart rate, which is 118 beats per minute, and is only a four beat difference from the second minute. This indicates to us that she is in steady state since it is within the five beat parameter. Although she's above the 110 beat minimum, she's not that much higher, so we will proceed to stage three. The speed for stage three is 3.4 miles per hour with a 14% grade. Some clients, depending on their size, may feel compelled to jog in stage three, but remind them that this is a walking protocol. Continue to monitor the client and measure heart rates at the end of each minute as in the previous stages. We will fast forward through stage three and take our third minute heart rate, blood pressure, and rating of perceived exertion readings. Our client had a heart rate of 126 beats per minute in minute one of the third stage, 132 beats per minute in minute two of the third stage, and 137 beats per minute in the last minute of the third stage. Since there was no more than a five beat increase from minute two to minute three, that is considered steady state. And since the standardized procedure states that we should not proceed to the next stage if steady state heart rate is 135 beats per minute or more, the test is now finished. To analyze the results, we need to know what our submaximal VO2 is. We know that the third stage was the final stage of the test where steady state heart rates were achieved, and that's where our client finished. So if we go up to our single stage prediction, stage three is equivalent to have an estimated submaximal VO2 of 31.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. We take that and write it in the appropriate slot for a female. Now we need the estimated heart rate maximum. And since this single stage equation was formulated with 220 minus age, that's what we'll use. She's 25 years old, so 195 beats would be her estimated maximal heart rate. Now we need her submaximal heart rate, and again, we look to stage three, since that's where she finished, and her heart rate at minute three of stage three was 137 beats per minute. So we record that in the appropriate slot on our data sheet. Now we simply follow the order of operations when calculating our results. So we'll do what's in the parentheses first. 195 minus 72 is 123. Then 137 minus 72 is 65. We now do what's in the brackets next, which is 123 divided by 65. And that comes out to a factor of 1.892. We now finish the equation by taking the submaximal VO2 of 31.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute and multiply that by the factor of 1.892 and our estimated VO2 max is 59 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Please note that I use fabricated data for this example. 
We speak in class about how it's good to recognize upper and lower ranges of VO2 and any kind of data, so that if a result is unrealistic, you should be able to recognize that and find out what happened, either in the procedures or in the calculations.